Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program. Special welcome to the, all the students and teachers that are joining us today. My name is Christy. I'm a librarian with the San Francisco Public Library. And before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are live streaming from San Francisco, which is the um, unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people who continue to work, live, and play here today. Thank you for being here with us for more than a month, our library celebration of Black History Month. We want to emphasize that reflection, open dialogue, interdisciplinary education, and shared advocacy needs to take place in our communities during Black History Month, as well as all year around, something our library is committed to. Check out the More Than a Month website at our San Francisco Public Library for all the upcoming events happening in person and virtual. They include amazing author talks, amazing artists, awesome book list, and so much more that align with the 2022 national theme, Black Health and Wellness. Today's program is inspired by the Black Inventor Bookmark Project, celebrating Black excellence in collaboration with Dr. Caroline Ramsom Scott here in San Francisco. Visit your local branch and pick one up today. There are four in total coming out over the next month or so. And now I wanna just give you a little snapshot of some of the youth-centered events that are happening. Next week, we have three amazing librarians in conversation about the black joy of books and resources for youth featuring SFPL's own Jason Hill and Rachel and our SFUSD partner, um, teacher librarian Ayana from the Tenderloin Community School. We're so excited about this, this um, conversation. And coming up, we have Alphabet Rockers, our local Grammy nominated um, troupe who have presented and created their first book, You Are Not Alone. So they're gonna be in conversation about this book. So join us for those events. Again, check out our website for all the amazing events that are free and available at your public library. You can also find out um, more books by Black authors and illustrators. With that, I want to also forecast next month's conversation with Career Girls, focusing on Black joy and friendship. So that's a forecast, but here you're with us today for this amazing, phenomenal conversation. Um, coordinated by Linda Calhoun. She's the CEO and founder of Career Girls. Career Girls is the largest online collection of career guidance videos focused on diverse and accomplished women. And today we're so lucky to be in conversation with Linda and four truly phenomenal innovators, inventors, and change makers of today. So thank you, Linda, for joining us. Thank you, Christy. It's wonderful to be able to present this program today. And I'm delighted to introduce our panel members. Uh, we have Afueko Nosakari Igbini Dion. Uh, we also have, thank you, we also have Elizabeth Smith. We have Cadence Payne and Marion Matu. You can read their full bios in all of the program descriptions that are available online. But you know, I had the privilege of interviewing these fantastic women role models for career girls. And before we bring them all into discussion, I just have to share with you uh, a sample of their videos. The all-time favorite project that I've ever worked on was my senior project at Stanford. And so before the project, I had taken a class on this thing called haptics. And haptics is the concept of the sense of touch and how you can create that sense of touch digitally. And so I became obsessed and, you know, wanted to figure out, you know, how can we create, you know, virtual worlds where you can feel the walls and feel the butterflies in the air and, you know, have just these really cool virtual experiences. So I 
created these things called the haptic gloves. And on each of the um, leather straps that were on your hand, there would be a motor inside that vibrated at different frequencies. So when you moved your hand and you touched something in the vir virtual world, whatever point of contact touched that object would vibrate on your hand. So you'd be able to kind of pick up things and throw them and like feel it in your hands as you were navigating the virtual world. Not only was I able to take an idea and a passion of mine and, you know, bring it from, you know, a concept to a full product. Product, but I was really able to see um, the power of computer science and the power of virtual reality and that we're really able to take things from our world and put people in an immersive environment in which they can see and experience things that they would have never experienced before. I have hardware flying. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to be given a project on the space station. Actually, I have a couple gadgets, but they're all gadgets. I don't have anything that's, uh, you know, like the arm, because I have friends who work on the arm. But I have this thing called the moding indicator. What the moding indicator does is um, you have the station, and it's flying, <laughs> and then you have the shuttle. So when the station and the shuttle come together, they both have control systems that allow them to stay in a certain uh, flight mode. We'll call it that. Uh, so depending upon which one is larger, when we first started, the shuttle was larger than the station. So the shuttle would ma maintain control and we would turn the station control off so that when it made it, the two control systems wouldn't fight each other and break the mating system. And the reason that this was kind of difficult because the station kept growing. So at a certain point, the station would have the primary control and the shuttle would have to turn off. And you have to build the software and the hardware in such a way that it worked that way so that you'd never break the docking mechanism. There are two docking mechanisms, which basically end up as one, which join the shuttle and the station. And in order for everyone to know that the moding was completed, a little red light blinks. That's my hardware. Mars is the red planet. Um, lots, of, lots of things are happening there. There are robots. Um, Curiosity is one that most people know about. Um, so it's the, one of the rovers that takes selfies. It also sings itself happy birthday. That's adorable. Uh, it's, it's really cute. Um, so Mars is very exciting. There's actually a new mission called Mars 2020, which is a new rover that's a little bit larger, much larger actually, than the previous rovers. Um, so there's a project there that one of my mentors is actually working on called MOXIE. Um, so that's a project to try and make oxygen on Mars using in situ resource utilization. So using the stuff that's already there to see if we can make oxygen so that humans can breathe there. Um, so obviously people know about Elon Musk and SpaceX that are trying to go to Mars and to try to sustain life on Mars. Um, so it's just very fascinating to imagine life elsewhere. Um, I definitely think that this is my personal opinion that we should start on the moon and then build bases there, prove that we can actually do it because it's a very similar, similarly challenging environment. And then from there, prove that we can and even maybe set up like fuel bases on the moon to like fuel rockets or get food or, you know, do stuff like that just before we go to Mars. But I think getting to Mars and sustaining human life is one of the most challenging things that we'll ever tackle as a species. As a design researcher, you're more or less like a problem solver. In any situation, you can quickly assess what the needs are, what the challenges are, and from there create products, create services, create programs that can help actual people. That's what I really enjoy about it, is that it's, it's not about me. I'm able to help others because of the experiences that I've had. One interesting opportunity that I had around design research was in a few months ago, whereby I worked with the organization Africa Code Week, and Africa Code Week is an initiative that supports young kid children in Africa to learn programming skills. And it was so interesting for me and really inspiring because I was actually had the opportunity to go back home to Kenya and work with the facilitators and, and use the tools and resources we had developed. So I, it was really amazing to see the work in action with the teachers, with the students. And that's basically what like design research is.
always fun to revisit the interviews that I've had with these women. And I'm also glad that everyone in the audience can have a little insight into the work and projects that they've worked on. So I'm gonna bring everyone into the discussion right now. And the first question I have for all of you is, you know, can you tell us about your favorite sources of inspiration? What inspires you? I'll go first. Um, so one thing that inspires me is seeing- I'm not sure I understand. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the one thing that definitely inspires me is seeing other people turn their dreams into a reality. Um, when I'm able to see my fellow entrepreneurs, um, women in my PhD programs who come from diverse backgrounds, bring the technology that they're really interested in into a field that, that needs innovation and see successful papers, successful companies and projects that benefit the wider community, that's something that really drives me to continue doing the work that I'm doing. Thank you. Yeah, I can actually even build on that because for me, like my sources of inspiration are, I would say, are my my friends. I'm really like strong um, group of women who really are so supportive. We share stories, we celebrate successes, and they always encourage me across the board. And just seeing how they have grown over the years to pursue the thing that they're doing right now um, really pushes me um, in my work and my my career. Thanks. Yeah, um, echoing echoing all those things. I think uh, having a strong support network, especially in your and your friends and family, is absolutely critical for maintaining you know inspiration and morale. Um, I think I also have a like a very specific example of inspiration for me personally stemmed from uh, the Hidden Figures movie and people who the women who were featured in that movie, like Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn. Um, I, I think personally I, that hit home right when I needed it to. Um, I was in I was an undergrad at my time or at that time when it came out, and I was like experiencing imposter syndrome and like questioning myself about my like fit in the field. Um, and so, like really witnessing those stories was a huge source of inspiration for me. Thank you. Uh, for me, for me, it's problem solving. Um, my expertise is um, in analysis of large complex systems. And um, my juices get, get flowing um, when I'm looking at the macro and the micro interactions and trying to find that one thing that created the problem and then back up from there and create a solution. But that's the thing that drives me, just trying to figure out what the problem is and how to solve it. You know, Elizabeth, I'm going to uh, continue uh, with my second question with, for you. You know, you talked about this problem solving with hardware and software. What role does creativity play in that? You know, how do, how do you bring that into, um, you know, your with your imagination and creativity with something like creating hardware flying? So I have to start with the word teamwork. Um, for me, uh, I'm a true engineer. Everything is numbers and analytics, but you got to have another enough people in it. Sorry, sorry, guys. You got to have enough people in the room that have different points of view and have different um, um, uh, capabilities. And uh, once you start bouncing those ideas off of each other, if you're listening, you can hear that coming through. And then you add on top of each other's ideas, you throw what we call throw it up against the wall to see what sticks. Um, but as you all work together, as the team works together, and as you uh, begin to understand and know where you're focused, that's where the create creativity uh, really lies. It's within the team. One person does not have all of the answers and everybody brings their perspective and their experiences to the table. And that's where you really, really, really get the job done. Thank you for that answer. And you know, what was coming through loud and clear from your response, Elizabeth, is how important it is to have that mutual respect for everyone at that table so that you can actually hear. You know, Afueco, I wanna bring you into uh, the discussion um, specifically to talk about the role of trial and error in that invention and creativity process. Talk to us about that. 
Yeah, so I am I mainly study artificial intelligence and the name of the game for artificial intelligence is truly trial and error. You kind of design these really complex mathematical systems that are, you know, approximating a function and then you, you know, try to get some data and train that model and you're testing different model types and different parameters and most of the time, especially just in any computer science project, you're going to fail the first time. And so being resilient and understanding that you have to find, you know, multiple ways that didn't work before you can find that one way that does work. And when you do find that one way that does work, maybe it's your 100th try, you may have done something super innovative and super important. Thank you. And Caden, um, oh, Marion, I'll, I'll start with you. As a design researcher, collaboration, you know, is key in the work that you do. And I just want to know if you can share some insights on what makes a successful or what you look for in a successful collaboration partner. Yes, um, having um, a collaborator and a partner in, in, in these projects that I'm involved in is, is, is very critical because I span like a lot of cross-functional teams and it's important like on the early onset to determine, you know, what is our vision? What is our goal? And as long as we are aligned in terms of having a shared vision in pursuit of what we're trying to achieve, then that's when um, I believe that's what makes a successful collaborator. And it's at that point, once that is determined early on, is when we can come together, brainstorm on different ideas and on and even just pivoting on what Elizabeth said in terms of like teamwork and just like bouncing ideas over each other. That's where the, the magic happens. Great, thank you. That respect and listening piece coming in again. And Cadence, tell us more about your vision for a moon station or a colony. Uh, what could life be like for us humans on the moon? Yeah, so um, a lot of people are really interested and really excited about expanding kind of human presence off planet. Um, and I think like what was mentioned in my video is that I think personally, you know, very, very personal bias opinion here um, is that we should start with the moon. Um, so somewhat because it's easier, but also because it is, a, is an excellent first stepping stone towards, you know, expanding our species into the solar system and pushing kind of the bounds of humanity and our technical capabilities. Um, I have recently shifted um, my interest, though, to be a little more Earth centered. Um, I'm very passionate about climate change monitoring and mitigation techniques. Um, our Earth is, is kind of going through it right now just because of some of the decisions that we've made as a species. Um, so I do think that um, focusing on, on Earth first is definitely um, my personal, I guess, next step, especially like in, in terms of my interest in my career. Um, however, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, by expanding our species and going to the moon and pushing our technical bounds, we are also, you know, creating new inventions and new innovative, you know, techniques and technologies that are going to benefit humanity. Um, so I think that we should, we could definitely focus on both. Um, I'm going to choose to focus on the earth, um, but I, I support those who are doing stuff, so. Great, Elizabeth, you wanna, come in on this question. Yeah, I wanted to tell Candace that um, I think she's a visionary because uh, that's exactly what we've been doing for on space station uh, in the space station program was preparing ourselves to move out uh, away from uh, the earth and the gateway program, which is our child program is actually in the process of uh, creating what I call a mini station that will be station keeping at the moon, as well as they are developing um, uh, procedures and um, hardware to create a moon base for men, man moon base in preparation to go to Mars. So you're such a visionary, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, I actually had a class um, here, I think my second year of grad school, where we looked at LOPG, the, the, the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway, that's, I think that's the acronym, um, which is the, the mini space station that you were talking about. And we were trying to kind of come up with ideas for potential landers from that. So that's really cool. Awesome. I mean, all of you are visionaries, and I appreciate you, Elizabeth, calling that out. And, you know, one of the things, um, and this is a question for the entire panel, you know, what gives you that confidence to experiment and try out these new ideas? And, you know, 
how do you handle it when something doesn't turn out the way you planned? And, you know, so give us some tips for our audience on, uh, you know, being resilient. So who would ever like I'd to like start? to kick that off. Um, basically springboarding on Waco's, if Waco's uh, comments earlier um, regarding how many times it takes to get it to work. But what I really want everyone to try to focus on is that um, in this area of science, if you become um, engrossed as I have, uh, you need to understand your worth. When you're surrounded by a bunch of scientists and uh, nerds as yourself, you may have a tendency to take for granted uh, your capabilities. And the one thing you need to understand is that you have real worth and that your concepts and the things that you're able to conceive and put into place are those kinds of things that not everybody can do. So know your worth. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on that a little bit. So um, one thing that I really struggled with at the start of my research career was feeling that everything that has been done has been done, right? there. It's so hard to outdo the grades. You know, we see all these amazing papers and these groundbreaking algorithms that have changed the game of computer science, artificial intelligence, and just engineering in general. And I really felt like, how can I even, you know, contribute to that? But one thing that really helped me is understanding that they paved the way and, you know, made that initial foundation. And if you understand that foundation deeply, the things that you can do can be so much greater than what they've done because you have so many more resources. And so understanding that we're placed here in a time where you know technical advancement is you know very advanced right but there's so much more that we can do for our environment for our communities and the applications that we can now apply all these amazing algorithms to are essentially endless and being able to tap into those new applications is really important yeah i just want to echo like I, I don't know, I, I have a saying that I tell people. So I work with um, nanosatellites or CubeSats. They're spacecraft that are about the size of a loaf of bread. Um, they're pretty novel still, um, basically trying to mimic what the larger like bus size spacecraft do, but in a shoebox. Um, so I, I notoriously tell people that CubeSats will hurt your feelings. Um, they often fail, they're really grumpy. Sometimes they get to orbit, they work for maybe a day and then they die and you don't know why. Um, so there's just like a lot of things that could go wrong and like, it's, it's okay to like feel things when, when they don't happen the way that you want them to happen. Obviously we all want our experiments and our hardware to work and to get good data. That's what like, that's everyone's dream. That's why we're doing it, right? But like not to take it personally when it doesn't because the things that we're doing and the things that we're trying and the ways that we're trying to push humanity, it's, it's really, really hard stuff. Um, so not taking it personally and still understanding that even if you do things and they fail, you still have impact. For me in my in my research work and also um, as a product manager, like early onset, one thing we always have to do is like define a plan. Like what what are we what we aim to achieve? And ninety percent of the time, it really doesn't happen as expected. And you know, and it's not anyone's fault. It's just you know what sometimes that's just how things happen. And so you know, you just have to always take every challenge as an opportunity. And also, I think it's also like a shift of mindset to understand that, you know, that that you acknowledge that not everything is going to go as is, but then appreciate also your own journey because it's not going to go very seamlessly, but then appreciate all those times maybe that that took you on a detour. And then what can you also learn from that? And that really pushes you now to, you know, see even things happen even better than you actually expected it. Oh my goodness, this was amazing content uh, and advice for anyone watching on uh, how to stay the course when things don't turn out maybe as you originally planned. Afuaco, I'd like to have you tell us more about some of the new projects that you're working on. Tell us about your latest innovation. Yeah, so um, my latest innovation is related to a startup company that um, me and my sister started. So it's called Hair Intelligence, and we use artificial intelligence algorithms, specifically computer vision algorithms, to automatically color match and size lace front wigs for women. And so you would think that, you know, lace front wigs are something that needs artificial intelligence, but um, it's really a difficult process for Black women and any woman who actually suffers with hair loss and just wants 
want to pull our hair, right? You have to go to a salon, you have to wait weeks for an appointment sometimes. When you get to the salon, you have to wait hours to get there, right? Um, you wait hours for the stylist to get to you. And then you sometimes don't want to piss off the stylist because if you make them mad, then they'll ruin your hair and then you go home and you're not satisfied, right? But we're really trying to find a solution that allows you to stay at home. Take some pictures. If you don't feel confident going outside because you, you know, suffer from hair loss, just take some pictures at home will create that beautiful look for you and send it directly to you. And what actually powers that is artificial intelligence algorithms. So we actually went out and collected a novel data set and developed some algorithms on top of that new data set that, you know, gave a really awesome baseline to really support women in their journey. And so it's just exciting for me to be able to use what I love, which is artificial intelligence and computer vision to really help women who, you know, are in the stone ages when it comes to beauty, you know, a lot of products for men and other fields are very technologically advanced. And I really think that it's time that women's beauty, healthcare, and, you know, fashion in general really has a technical evolution. Wow. Thank you <laughs> for the work that you're doing in that regard. Um, you know, I can speak for, I think, women uh, all over who are really grateful uh, that you're applying that intellect and talent in this new career. Um, Elizabeth, you've recently retired, um, but my question is, and after a very successful career, obviously, um, you know, what advice do you wish you had been given at the start of your career? Well, you have to understand me at the start of my career. There was nothing I couldn't do. <laughs> That was just me. Uh, nothing too big, nothing too little. Um, the world was my oyster. I had achieved my dream. My dream was to become an engineer. And during the time that I came through, um, when you said you were going to be an engineer, they thought about the locomotive. And so I always had to explain myself. But with that, actually two degrees, because I'm a dual degree student, uh, a dual degree recipient, with those two degrees in hand, the world was my oyster. Um, the one thing that I've learned along the way is to be mentored and to mentor others. Um, those are the two most significant things that any person can be involved in and can do for someone else. Unmuting here, thank you. Amazing, amazing answer. Um, Cadence, you obviously could do anything. <laughs> um, tell us, why did you decide to focus on aerospace? Um, I don't have, I don't have like a cliche story of like, oh, I saw a rocket launch when I was four. And then like, since, you know, I, I didn't have that story. But one, one thing that I love to do when I was like a kid and I still loved it, it's like my favorite pastime, um, is to go stargazing. I love, I don't know, the stars are beautiful. I'm from Kentucky and we don't have a lot of light pollution. So me and my friends used to like throw blankets down in a field and like stare at the stars and talk for hours. And it was just like always so beautiful. And then I learned one day that I could actually like study that as a career. Um, and that was just like the coolest opportunity that I'd ever heard of. And so I decided to actually do it. Um, even though like I ended up taking a path that's not necessarily, you know, I'm not an astronomer, I'm not an astrophysicist. So I'm not directly looking at the stars. I'm providing hardware that allows people to, you know, study things that are in space. Um, and so like that kind of motivation from just my, my love of, of the universe, um, just developing that love over the years um, has kept me going and kept me inspired to be in this field. Um, I also love the earth now, which is why I'm transitioning to doing more earth science stuff. So. Awesome. I love that uh, visual of you and your friends stargazing. And um, Marion, uh, my question for you is that aha moment when you knew that the work you are doing was the right path for you? When did that happen? Yeah. So that actually happened quite recently, but then um, I'll tell like a brief story what led to that actual aha moment. So um, when I was 17, so I'm from Kenya, so I studied in Kenya um, and my, my teacher in high school was like, you know, um, told the students put together like a vision board of what you see yourself doing in future. And so in my vision board, like vehicles 
or plastered all over it. I was like, imagine myself building vehicles, designing vehicles. And in Kenya, like that, that vision sometimes was not really possible because we in Africa in general, they, we don't really um, manufacture vehicles to that type of scale. So over time, I must say that dream kind of did diminish. And I was like, maybe that's not possible. You know, I'll figure out something else. Fast forward last year um i got a job at raven automotive and that's where we we now and we do build vehicles electric vehicles and so it was just like wow coming from that girl who was in kenya to now in the u.s working for an automotive um, company i'm like wow it's like it's happening so i think for me that's what it happened thank you i love that you were able to share that story with us um, I have a question from our audience, and uh, it says, when will humanity achieve full AGI software? I don't know what that means. Does anybody know what that means? Maybe it's okay. going to be like AI. Well, they, it says full AGI software. Okay, so maybe that's too inside uh, baseball, but thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, another question I have for you is, um, can you talk a little bit more about the role that mentors have played in your careers? And so this is your opportunity to give that shout out to uh, any impactful mentor that really kept you on your way, whoever wants to start. So I, I do the thing where I have multiple mentors at all times. Um, I think that's honestly like really important because a lot of, you know, getting different perspectives from people who are at different phases and different sectors of the field kind of allows you to kind of shape your own path. Um, there's no straight path. You shouldn't like aim to follow someone else's path verbatim. I'm um, just throwing that out there. But I don't know, I've had a, a bunch of mentors like an undergrad. I had um, Dr. Malfaris and Professor Panuti um, who kind of like saw saw something in me and like oh, allowed me my first internship opportunity at MIT's Haystack Observatory, which then like transitioned into me getting another set of mentors that then encouraged me to go to grad school. And now I have another set of mentors who like keep me on track for my projects and my career goals. And I, I, I don't know, I just think like having a really diverse set of people that you can pick their brains and ask them questions. Even if you like cold email someone and you're like, hey, I just wanna to talk to you about your life. Um, it's surprisingly easy to get people to talk to, about their lives. Um, and I think that that leads to a great opportunity for you to actually get mentorship and just to hear, you know, other people's experiences. Yeah, I can also add to that. Um, one thing that I've realized about mentors is that not everyone who is um, senior to you is your mentor, and you really have to find the people that are going to help you along your journey. I think that a lot of times people want you to kind of follow in their footsteps and want you to, you know, do the things that they did in their career to get to where you're going. But, um, you know, Cadence was mentioning having multiple mentors. That's so important because, you know, having multiple people's perspectives that allow you to forge your own path is really the, the goal of like when you're having your own mentor, not copying somebody's path or wanting to be like somebody because you have to understand that you can never be like anybody else. And it's really up to you to decide what you want and use this resources you have, which can be mentors to get there. Yeah, definitely like, um, agree on both those points. Um, for me, I particularly like for me where mentorship was really key was early on in my career. Um, as mentioned, so uh, there was a point at which I wasn't too sure if my journey in automotive would actually happen, especially when I was um, in, in undergrad and my professor, Dr. Kamau Gashigi, um, who was um, a professor of mechanical engineering, that was my department at the University of Nairobi. I remember he, um, he was able to like a group of students, he actually supported us to like really think about not just your typical, you know, engineering type of um, path, but really thinking outside the box in terms of making, developing projects, um, going into robotics. And for us, it was like, wow, this is all very new to us, coding and, and everything. And so that really, that time with, with him and those group of students at that time was like, um, and his advice and, um, and, and, and his support really helped me to really, you know, think outside the box and be like, hey, you know, maybe there's actually more out there. Maybe I should push myself to actually 
look outside and see what other potential opportunities could be there. So it was really, he was really pivotal, pivotal point for me at that point. Elizabeth? I was very fortunate to come along uh, during a time uh, as a young engineer when my senior management um, had daughters who were breaking into the professional field as well. And they had their daughters coming home with their experiences as you know, being the first or the second woman. And so they poured a lot into me as a result of that. Um, they decided that they would provide to me the things, the kinds of things that their daughters weren't getting so that they could kind of compensate for the lack of support on their end and give me that support. So I greatly benefited. Um, there were several, several, several senior level engineers at, at NASA that did that for me. And I'm very grateful. It's wonderful. You know, another question that came in from the audience kind of touches on this, this notion of imposter syndrome. It's, you know, how do you overcome the feeling of not knowing enough in your field? Um, anybody want to speak to that, Elizabeth? So um, working on space station, um, I had the uh, opportunity to, to work on something that didn't exist and had never existed before. So we were all as a group groping in the dark. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that's kind of the feeling. Um, and the way you overcome that is just with hard work. You do your research, you read, you dig, you ask questions, you try things, you fail, you start over again, you just keep moving. The one thing that can overcome that is just more understanding, more discussion, more um, tri um, trial and failure and trial and baby steps. Don't be upset when all you get is a baby step. That's better than nothing. And then you take that and put it back into the, the pot, stir it again and start over. Um, that's the whole point of engineering. And I'm an engineer and I'm sorry, but that's my, that's my, from my viewpoint. Please don't apologize. That's awesome advice. Yeah, I just want to like echo that super quickly in that I think the feeling of not knowing everything is never going to go away because it's impossible to know everything. Um, but I think like as long as you stay inspired and motivated and excited about what you're doing, you can mitigate that feeling to the point where you're like, okay, well, I don't know everything, but I do have tools now to like work towards that understanding and build that muscle, like that knowledge muscle so that I can know things and can apply myself. But like, you're not going to know, you're not going to know much when you're just getting started, but you still have to get started. You still have to keep going so that you can build that. Can I just add that early on in my career, someone told me something which has stuck with me when it comes to imposter syndrome. So I remember at one point, um, someone like in senior leadership was having a discussion with her and I was like one of the only female engineers at that time at that company. And we were just having a conversation and I was just like, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I feel a bit subconscious about like, you know, when I go out in the field and maybe people undermine me because I'm young, I'm the only woman. And, um, and, some, and she reached out to me and she was like, you know what? everyone else is also trying to figure it out. It's not just you. So if you ever feel like, oh, I don't know, and everyone else is like better off, everyone is also thinking the same thing. So it's not just you. So always remember that. And it's also, it helps calm me down too. <laughs> yeah, one thing that really helps me when dealing with imposter syndrome is understanding that, you know, even if you have the same exact knowledge as somebody else, your experiences are different and you will never, ever, ever write the same exact research or the same algorithm, the same paper as that person. You might come up with the same solution, but it will be in a different way. And that kind of gives me a little bit of comfort because I can always learn more, but nobody can be me. Nobody can bring my experience to the table. And because of that, I will always have something unique to bring. And speaking of those unique experiences, you know, one thing I always want our audiences to understand and when they get a chance to be around amazing role models like yourself is what skills or interests or talents from your childhood, you know, what did little Elizabeth Cadence of Fuego and Marion do 
that you're still doing now in the work? Yeah, so I can actually start off with this, which might be a little bit embarrassing, but um, when I was in middle school, I was not allowed to have social media, um, and social media back then was MySpace, right? And so if you can remember what MySpace was, it was those little profiles, and you could customize, like, the look and feel of that, and so um, because I wasn't allowed to have it, I didn't really put, like, pictures of myself, or I would, like, edit the pictures in a weird way so you wouldn't know it was me, and so I learned HTML, CSS, web design, um, web editing, photo editing, all of those things that I was just doing to customize my MySpace profile. It's crazy because I still do all of those things today. And even though I'm not a graphic designer or editor, um, people always come to me like, hey, can you help me fix this picture? Can you help me do this? Because I've learned all of these cool old school ways to do things. And, you know, being able to build off of that and the software of today, um, it's a skill that I never realized would come so in handy in my field right now. Skills, I love it, Afuega. <laughs> Yeah, I think mine was more of a set of like soft skills that I learned. So I, um, I cheered for nine years, I think um, I cheered for nine years. And I was also like heavily involved with like all different kinds of like social clubs when I was in middle and high school. Um, so I think that like really like the whole like performing in front of a group of people like really helped like my ability to like be outspoken and to like speak up when like things when like I see things or like I'm excited about things to so, like actually, you know, have the confidence to kind of project um, and then also like the whole like being involved with clubs and things taught me like teamwork and then like organizational skills and leadership skills. I think like all those soft skills combined like really helped shape the engineer that I am today, especially in terms of like project management and like being a system engineer and like kind of monitoring multiple facets of different teams. Those skills are like, in, like so, so valuable. Like would, yeah, very proud of those. <laughs> I can also talk about when I was younger, I think for me, it comes around like problem solving. When I was younger, I would take apart like families, electronics, like TV. And back then we used to have like the, the CRTs. <laughs> I was just like open them up and I didn't know what was going on, but I was just very curious all the time, just trying to figure out like what's going on in, in, in this, what, what is all this circuitry? And over the years, obviously, like I'm getting into engineering, that really helped me to um, learn more about um, hardware and software. And even today in, in my work as a product manager, you know, problem solving is key. And so when I think about it, I'm like, hmm, over time, that's really what developed and, and was really innate in me. Cool. Elizabeth? Um, I can definitely echo the tearing things up scenario. I got in trouble a lot because I kept taking everything apart. And uh, I'm the only girl in the family of boys um, and I'm the youngest and they really wanted a girly girl, but they got me. <laughs> and uh, even at elementary school, I was really um, able to work in a science uh, centered in, in uh, elementary school. And uh, I was very um, uh, vocal in terms of uh, understanding and uh, discussions and helping other students understand. And so um, fortunately or unfortunately, I've kind of been a nerd my whole life. Um, but yeah, it was that wanting to know how things work and not taking no for an answer. Um, that was kind of me. And, and they told me I was really bossy. <laughs> Which is a great thing. <laughs> I loved uh, having you all sort of go back to your childhood and bring it up to today. You know, um, we're really at a point where it's the last question and this is a lightning round. Um, moon or Mars? Both. <laughs> I'm moon before. A fuego? Moon. Marion? I'll say moon. And Elizabeth? Oh, I think you froze. Oh, no, you're moving. Moon or Mars? She might be having some technical difficulties. I'm uh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Oh, I said moon or Mars? Both. <laughs> yeah, I because 
as we discussed earlier, the moon base is in preparation for Mars. So yeah, we're gonna go, we're gonna do the moon, and that's gonna be in a, what in in space terms is a short term thing, three to five years, um, maybe four, but three to five, and then all of that is in preparation for what we call D space, which for us is Mars because it's the closest thing to us. But yeah, both. Awesome. And ladies, that's it. That's our last word. Um, I want to thank each of you for sharing your journey with us and our thanks to the live and recorded audiences for joining us to learn about Black innovators and inventors making their mark. Thank you. Well, Linda, we want to thank you and ask you the question, moon or Mars? Moon. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Thank you, um, amazing women, for sharing your story, talking about your journey today, being um, role models to our students here in San Francisco and beyond. It is such an honor to host this program. If you love this program, it'll be recorded. So check our YouTube channel at the library, share it with all your friends, make sure they know about these amazing women. Um, and And our tech check earlier this week, Linda shared, she's like, I have the best job. And I see why she gets to take time and interview and meet and uplift these amazing women doing incredible things all around America and beyond. So thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and check our calendar for upcoming events. Our next one with Career Girls is celebrating Black joy and friendship on March 9th. So tune in. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.